The best city in the world. Been to most of them in Canada, and this is it. I love Montreal. I love it. It's a great city. The quality of life is fantastic. I haven't found any places it's exciting to be in, and it's interesting, and it has such good food. They're moving away from Montreal, away from Quebec, away from the tension between English and French. After a time, you just get worn down. You get just tired of hearing the same garbage, the same crap on the news every day, the same silly political games going on. Just tired of waking up every morning to it on the news, in the newspapers, over and over, without it ever finishing. I have always been proud to be a Montrealer. I just love, I think it's the most beautiful city in Canada. And uh, not to mention, this is my home, and I've lived here all my life. Eric has asked his employers to transfer him to Ottawa, where Rosa will pursue her career as a freelance journalist. I'm sad that it's come to this pass. Both Rosa and I have always felt sort of, well, no, we're not going to give in. We're really not going to give in. Uh, all these other people have, but we're die hard. We're going to stick around. And here we go, huh? <laughs> it's been a massive exodus. In 20 years, 300,000 English-speaking people have left Montreal, left Quebec. It's one of the great migrations of Canadian history. As the exodus continues and Montreal becomes more and more French, it's hard to believe that there was once a time when this city had more English-speaking citizens than French. A time when the mayor was English. And a time when English Montreal had its own team in the NHL, the Maroons, a team that defeated Les Canadiens and won the Stanley Cup. French signs outside English stores. It's the law here, and the symbolism of this law has done much to speed up the exodus toward Ontario and the West. Nowhere else in the free world are people forbidden to use their own language on their signs. January 1989. Anglophones have gathered to protest Bill 178 the sign law that creates a mask to hide the true face of multilingual Montreal. Defy the law. It's an immoral law and therefore there's no compunction to follow the law. The crowd is being urged to practice civil disobedience. But very few will do this. Law breaking does not come easily to middle class Anglos who are, above all, polite. The main purpose of the sign law is to preserve Quebec's French face. The government wants to send a clear message to all the immigrants coming to Quebec to let them know that even though they're coming to North America, they're coming to Quebec, which is a French province, and French is the official language. That's Ludmilla de Fougerol is head of the Commission for the Protection of the French Language, French. which can take stubborn Anglos to court. Uh, we are very... Um, liberal in the way we interpret the law. We are very patient. We take a lot of time. We try and persuade people to comply with the law. Hot Bengal chutney. Bachelor's marrow fat peas. Good old British products on sale here in Montreal West, where the language police have been frequent visitors. They're particularly offended by a sign in which George Davies welcomes his customers in Welsh. 
This is definitely not French, and the government wants it obfuscated or obliterated, and that's not all. These also are some of the letters that I've received from the Régie de la Langue stating that certain words, English words, have to be covered. Free parking, customers only, violations towed away, no parking, beef, Davies Brothers, purveyors of fine foods, got lots of them, uh, fresh fish, closed, please use other door. This is one of the uh, things that I was asked to please cover up by the uh, Régie de la Langue because of it being uh, unilingual English. So I took a piece of one inch masking tape, as you can see, I've covered it, and apparently now everything is fine. They're quite happy uh, that it's covered, so <laughs> I don't understand it. Foreigners find all this a comic opera, but many Montreal Anglophones are bewildered, angered, frightened. They see it as a deep desire by the French for all Anglos to become invisible, to vanish. And many have been quite willing to vanish by their thousands. At McGill, many Anglophone students are completely bilingual. But there's a belief that that's not quite enough. That it's very hard to get a good job in Montreal if your family name happens not to be French. I'm basically an Anglophone, so I think I will probably go to Ontario to find a job. Probably Ontario and New Brunswick. Hopefully Vancouver. Uh, Vancouver's a nice city. I'm considering going out there. Okay. Do you think you're going to be staying in Montreal after you finish your studies? No. <laughs> what does this mean for English Montreal? Will it become a community without young people, without children? A community of the elderly and the aged? I have a lot of trouble with French. I feel as if I, I'm being forced to speak it. I'm being forced to, to integrate within the French culture and, and, and be a Quebecois. As Montreal celebrated its 350th birthday, more scars were appearing on the face of the city. Downtown, economic decay in the old Anglo areas. Buildings demolished, but not replaced. Could this be an omen of things to come? In the next century, could the English-speaking element here dwindle to almost nothing, leaving Montreal completely French? It's a notion that would have astonished a man like William Dow. Back in the 1860s, Mr. Dow owned a big brewery, and the people who worked for him jolly well worked in English. The Montreal world of Mr. G. Parrish Ogden was entirely English. And so was that of Colonel Dyde and Mr. Babbage. Master H. Montague Allen and Master Bryce Allen, who lived in a house with 14 servants, most of them imported from England. It was the legendary Square Mile, stretching from Dorchester Boulevard to the slope of Mount Royal. By the end of the 19th century, the men who lived here controlled three quarters of the wealth of Canada. Mrs. Gibb resided in the square mile, and Mrs. Taverner, and Miss Legg, and Miss G.F. Murray, who was always being asked to dance. St. Andrew's Ball. Since 1843, the highlight of Montreal's social season, a frolic for the rich. As they danced until dawn, they could never have dreamed that there would come a day at a future St. Andrew's Ball when their descendants would be part of a nervous minority because the language they spoke was English. But still, the old traditions are bravely upheld. They've brought the haggis to the guest of honor, the Earl of Errol, 
who's come over from Scotland to stab it with his ancestral dirk. His knife, see rustic labor dicht, and cut ye up, ah. we ready ah. slicht. Ah. Quenching your gushy entrails, brecht. Warm reeking, rich. Donald Smith, another Scot, was certainly rich. In his house in the square mile, there were Raphaels and Titians on the wall. And here, over the years, he entertained 12 earls, eight dukes, and six viscounts. But only a small fraction of Montreal's Anglos lived in the square mile. Many thousands more lived well down the hill, in Point St. Charles, Griffintown, Goose Village. Large families slept and ate in a single small room. There was no running water, no toilets inside. Disease was rampant, and the infant mortality rate was among the highest in the world. Children who lived here often worked in factories 12 hours a day. Dock workers and other laborers earned wages that were among the lowest in North America. Quebecois mythology holds that the English grew rich by exploiting the French. But those old robber barons up on the hill were all equal opportunity employers, quite happy to exploit their fellow Anglos as well as the French. A student got really pissed off at me and he said, you know Eric, you, you Anglos, for 300 years you've been exploiting us. I'm 35 years old, give me a break, you know. I personally exploited you for 300 years, how do you figure this out? We were English, but we didn't entirely think of ourselves as English and French. That really wasn't the way it was divided. Graham de Carey, professor of history. A really deep resentment of the rich English. Because the way Quebec has traditionally operated, the rich English and the rich French ran it between them and the rest of us were expected to follow behind. A common misconception here in Montreal and Quebec is that most of the homeless and poor are not Anglophone. Um, that's very, very false. Many, many Anglophones come here. Jerry Lafferty runs St. Michael's Mission downtown. Thank you. It's often said that Montreal Anglos, when they criticize Quebecois nationalism, want to go back to the good old days, when the greedy English dominated the French. But for most Anglos, those bygone days weren't all that good. We had one man, his daughter, daughter died. She was about three or four years of age. And uh, he couldn't afford to bury her. He cost $25 for a coffin, and uh, he couldn't afford it. So he came over to us, and me and a little Irish guy, we stayed at 3 o'clock in the morning. We made a beautiful little coffin out of white pine. We were as poor as anyone in the neighborhood. The curious thing was that in school we were taught that because we were English, we had a superior business sense. It never occurred to us to wonder why, if we were so damn smart, we were living with all those poor French people. The new map in 1760 was in English. That was the year the Marquis de Vaudreuil surrendered Montreal to General Geoffrey Amherst. New France was to become a British colony. And from now on, in these streets, English would be heard as well as French. Montreal's location was ideal for trade with Europe. But for large ships, the Lachine Rapids blocked the St. Lawrence River and the route to inland North America. And so, in the 1820s, a canal was built to bypass these rapids. This Lachine Canal was a heroic achievement, according to historian Sam Allison. The construction of this canal was the most ambitious and most expensive project in Canada up to that time. Built by pick and shovel, it was nonetheless a great engineering feat. James Richardson, who promoted the project, was a Scot. Burnett, the chief engineer, was English. David David, who promoted the project politically, was Jewish. The canal workers came from the British Isles. 
So the canal builders reflected the English-speaking Montreal of that time. Besides transportation, the new canal provided water power to run the mills and factories that sprang up on its banks. Canada's first boot and shoe factory, its first paint factory, foundries, cotton mills, shipyards. The axes used by lumbermen in the Ottawa Valley were made here and sized for the farms of Ontario. Montreal had become the cradle of Canadian industry. The new industries needed skilled craftsmen and laborers and most of them came across from England, Scotland and Ireland. It was these immigrants who built the Victoria Bridge across the St. Lawrence River, a structure that would be hailed as the eighth wonder of the world. Montreal was destined to become the world's largest inland seaport. And in its time, one local company, the Allen Line, would own no fewer than 137 ships. Europe, Asia, Africa. While ships of the Allen Line sailed eastward, another enterprise of Montreal Anglos, the Canadian Pacific Railway was pushing its tracks to the west, toward the Pacific Ocean. Soon the commerce of Montreal would circle the globe. Meanwhile, the city's prosperity attracted large numbers of French Canadians who came in from the farms to work in the factories. And by 1870, the Anglos were no longer in the majority. Absolutely, isn't that the little place? At the St. Andrew's Ball, the ancestors of most of these merrymakers came from the British Isles. They're dyed in the wool Anglos, Anglophone pure laine. But what about Antoinette and Louis Caruso, just married? Where do they stand in the linguistic scheme of things? Their families came from Italy. And so, in the unique terminology of Quebec officialdom, they're neither Anglophones nor Francophones, but Allophones. For most Montrealers of Italian descent, English is the Canadian language of choice. Thus, despite the allophone label, you could say that these Italians, especially the younger ones, are actually Anglophones, part of English Montreal. Best wishes on your wedding day and a life long and happy in love from the gang. Dagli amici compari Patrizia e Jack Mullet. In Montreal, there are almost 200,000 people of Italian descent, the largest of the city's many ethnic groups. Come siete belli! Che bella cosa! If Quebec is different from Canada, Montreal is different from Quebec. The rest of the province is virtually all French. But in Montreal, there are more English-speaking people than the entire population of New Brunswick. The allophones, the immigrants. The law makes them send their children to French schools. But English is always a great temptation. And the future of the city's linguistic makeup depends largely on choices made by these many ethnic groups. It's a French city that the nationalists want. And when immigrants keep gravitating toward English, it's a matter of concern for people like Gilles Proux, host of a popular talk show on French radio. Well, it's a shame for us uh, to find out that some people are arriving here and after three weeks, three months or three years, they say, uh, we're in America here, we're not in Quebec, speak English. It's an insult. Immigrants, they say, should show respect for the language and culture of the majority. But that phrase, show respect, makes many newcomers uneasy. It reminds them of oppressive regimes in other countries, and many of them, after a sojourn in Montreal, decide to move on, to join the exodus. Some are headed towards the States, some have already left and have headed to Vancouver. Uh, 
some are thinking of moving to Greece just like me because I'm Greek so some are planning to stay here but most of my friends are planning to leave hockey in English Montreal that's where the game was invented with rules that were drawn up in 1878 by three students at McGill football McGill versus Harvard in 1874 the first ever international football game lacrosse our national sport in the 1870s with great teams fielded by the Montreal Amateur Athletic Association and there were intrepid cyclists too who wore the colors of the MAAA and in 1890 Louis Rubinstein brought glory to the city by going to St. Petersburg and winning the World Figure Skating Championship. There was culture too in English Montreal and there was an eager welcome for visitors like Charles Dickens, Mark Twain and Oscar Wilde. In more recent times in the creation of literature in English Montreal has been far ahead of the rest of Canada Little magazines published here were the first to give voice to poetry in the modern vein. The first group was uh, consisted of A.J.M. Smith and Frank Scott and A.M. Klein, Leo Kennedy. They started around uh, 1925 or so. It's called the Poet's Corner in Ben's Delicatessen downtown. Generations of Montreal poets have eaten here, among them Louis Dudek, poet and professor of English. Colonial cultures are conservative. Canadian culture in Victoria, Winnipeg, in uh, Toronto were slow to change and would not easily take on the modernism of a E. e. Cummings or an Ezra Pound or a T.S. Eliot. F.R. Scott was certainly open to change. He was in at the very beginning of the modern movement. Then there was Irving Layton, who emerged in the 1940s and Leonard Cohen, writers who took risks in a Canada that was cautious and correct. As I've said sometimes, it seems to be uh, the destiny of Montreal to show the rest of the country from time to time what poetry is. Hugh McLennan, novelist. In fiction as well as poetry, Montreal has nurtured a disproportionate number of Canada's best writers like Mordecai Richler, Mavis Gallant, and Brian Moore, who wrote his first books while living in this city. And, of course, the man who was the most widely read Canadian author of all time, Stephen Leacock. Also in Montreal, Ernest Rutherford, pioneer atomic physicist and winner of the Nobel Prize. Carrie Derrick, the first woman in Canada to become a full professor. Dr. Wilder Penfield, Dr. Maud Abbott, Dr. William Osler, world-famous medical pioneers, all associated with McGill University. The nightlife of bygone Montreal, another Anglo domain, with music by Ina Ray Hutton and her melodiers and Oscar Peterson at the Alberta Lounge. Johnny Holmes at Victoria Hall. The Saturday Night Dance. The Club Saint Michel was the place to go back in the 1940s and 50s. And Rockhead's Paradise. The El Morocco. The Bellevue Casino. The Copacabana. The Latin Quarter. A city of nightclubs. A show business city. Miss Noelle Toy, the Chinese stripper. And Rosita Royce, who danced with her doves. Wicked, wicked Montreal. They called it the Paris of North America, and American tourists came in droves. But oddly enough, this particular Paris was an Anglophone invention. The entrepreneurs who created it were almost all Anglos. Well, I took over the property. Uh, this belonged to the fish market next door. And uh, this whole area here was covered with a roof. 
and there was 10 inches of concrete on the ground. It was in 1961 that Eric McLean acquired the neglected Papineau House in Old Montreal and started restoring it, the beginning of an Anglo enterprise that would help preserve French history. This area is the thing that gives Montreal its richness and depth. Otherwise, it would be just like any other large industrial town across North America. This, after all, is where the very first uh, French colonists landed off there. But by the 1950s, old Montreal was a crumbling industrial wasteland. Historic buildings were being torn down to create parking lots until Eric McLean moved into the old Papineau house. I was soon followed uh, within a couple of years by Fred Lebensold, and he bought the fish market next door and fixed that up into condos. And then uh, Aird Nesbitt bought the Calvay house down at the corner. And then uh, B.J. Brainerd, a woman, bought one over on uh, Place Jacques-Cartier. And from there on, it was just expanding and expanding and expanding. And so, with Anglophones leading the way, old Montreal, with its rich French heritage, came to be preserved. For more than three centuries, until the quiet revolution of the 1960s, the Roman Catholic Church dominated the life of Quebec. To it goes much of the credit for preserving the French language in this corner of North America. But there was a price to pay. The church urged its followers to stay on the farm, to look inward, to avoid contact with the English. Thus, by largely withdrawing from the field, they left the way clear for the Anglos to dominate industry and commerce. Education in French Quebec was based on the values of 17th century Catholic France. Those who were born to lead, the children of the rich, got excellent education in private schools. Those who were born to follow, the children of the poor, well, there was no point in wasting education on them. The result was that in Quebec, the rich only interest in public schooling was to keep the cost down. Even after the Quiet Revolution, when the education system democratized, the private school remained very important for the children of the rich. The French often blame the English for the educational problems of their society. The fact is, it was their own elite that did them in. Up to recent years, in most big Montreal offices, you had to speak English if you wanted to get ahead. And it helped if you were English as well. To Francophones, this was a major injustice. This and the fact that you couldn't get served in French in large department stores. Resentments like these helped fuel the rise of nationalism and separatism. In the quiet revolution of the 1960s, the state took over from the church as the protector of the French language and culture, but the state had powers the church never had. It could pass laws like Bill 101 that required the use of French in all companies employing more than 50 people. In Montreal, big business, Anglophone business, was frightened by the new language laws of 1977. And in three years, more than 600 companies moved their head offices out of Quebec. This left a vacuum that French businessmen could fill. And now it was young Anglos who couldn't get jobs in big offices. Meanwhile, industry kept on leaving. And in Montreal, unemployment and poverty came to be among the worst in Canada. At the Salon du Livre, Journalist William Johnson is promoting his new book. In it, he examines 150 years of French-Canadian literature, where the predominant theme is anger, directed at the English. You see it in such uh, poets as Gaston Miron. Miron's whole work is based on saying this, I'm suffering anguish, I, I have no identity, I can't speak because my, my identity is broken because of the Anglos who, are, who have stopped, who, they call me speak white, they call me Pepsi, they call me uh, floor sweeper, and he, he can't exist because of the Anglo. You have Fernand Ouellette, another poet, exactly the same theme. He says that whatever 
uh, is English in this society is taken away from the French and keeps the French from being what it should be. In La Rage by Louis Amelin, which won the Governor General's Award for 1989, you have the hero who does not get the heroine. She's a figure of Quebec. Because he's not hard enough, the heroine says, you can't be a lamb, you have to attack, you have to destroy. And, and periodically the angle is presented as punched in the face, his nose all bloody. That is the constant portrayal for 150 years. And no one ever talks about this. It's the mythology of the Anglo, the Anglo as a serpent. So I wrote a book to finally get this across, not primary to English-speaking people. That's not my audience. I wrote it in French because I am targeting the intellectuals. I'm saying, don't you see what you're doing? How can you allow this ideology or this mythology, which is a, a school of hatred, to go on for 150 years. And I feel that if we're going to have any kind of a truly liberal debate in this society and in this country, we have to come to terms with these old demons, these old priest-ridden uh, myths that still walk. The priests are dead, they're buried, they're, the skin has fallen off their bones, but they're still controlling us from a distance, from the graveyard. We're still walking with these old mythologies in our heads. He talks about the chemin, these are all my friends. He insults all my friends. J'ai parlé de beaux chemins aussi, j'ai parlé de Gaston Miron, c'est sûr. Faire ça ici, extraordinaire. But if French authors habitually vilify Anglos, the opposite almost never occurs. But when it does occur, or seems to occur, it can bring on an outpouring of rage in the French media. That's what happened when Mordecai Richler published his notorious book. It was hysteria, paranoia, uh, and I was misquoted very often. The first two people to stand up and denounce the book and call for its banning had never even read it, which helped. <laughs> so no one was responding to my specific points. The main thrust of the book dealt with the sign laws. There is no possible intellectual defense of these laws. So critics concentrated on the 30 or 40 pages that deal with uh, the anti-Semitism of the past in Quebec. And this is where the subject of controversy in the book. What I did say is that anti-Semitism is a more serious problem in this province than it is in the rest of Canada. This was not an invention of mine. I based it on three independent academic surveys. I didn't write these surveys. I didn't commission them. I just reported on their contents. The English leadership of Quebec has to speak to the power, to the French majority, and therefore it's always concerned about the danger of offending that majority, and it very seldom says what is really on our mind. It never says to the majority, look, we are offended, this is degrading, this is humiliating, and this cannot be tolerated. That kind of thing never gets said. This will never do. It's a flagrant offense, and some citizens were very upset. Len Cocolicchio, Point Clare City Councilor, explained. People in question uh, took their concern to the uh, Commission de Protection de Langue Française, and the Commission sent, uh, I guess, a team of uh, grown men and women to comb the streets of Point Clare looking for Point Clare signs that did not have the hyphen. Without the hyphen, it's English. With the hyphen, it's French. So now the city has been busy the last uh, couple of months uh, inserting those hyphens. It's an arduous task, but it will be done. We can let the Commission know, and uh, all of these people who are concerned about missing hyphens can sleep well at night. The hyphen had to go in, but the apostrophe had to come out to make it look French. So Young's was now young. Should the sign law cause despair, or is ridicule more appropriate? As in the music of Bowser and Blue. The Berlin Wall has finally fallen. We watch them all celebrate. The Romanian people have thrown up their chains and Saddam was kicked out of Kuwait. In Russia, a KGB coup didn't work without the people's consent. But me. Quebec. A woman was fined for displaying a sign that said apartment for rent. It says welcome in 35 languages. 
But in Montreal, in the year of the city's 350th birthday, 34 of these languages are illegal when displayed in front of a store. When the sign law first came out, big stores like Eaton's immediately complied with every detail. But some smaller stores, like this one, challenged the law. I am not prepared to change nor remove my signs. At this point, we've been in court about 10 times. Uh, we're continuing on. We, I feel we're going to end up in the Supreme Court of Canada. Harry Schick runs a suburban pastry shop that has caught the attention of newspapers in the United States and Europe. They've reported with incredulity a government's unceasing efforts to make a small store hide its English name. If I, God forbid, lose this case, I still do not see myself changing these signs ever. They will always remain bilingual. I'm prepared to go to jail. If they don't want to put me in jail, I'm afraid they're liable to seize my store. If they seize my store, they're going to put 26 people on unemployment. That's wonderful for the province of Quebec with the unemployment rate so high. The minutes of the meeting go back to 1822. And from the walls, past presidents look down with sublime Anglo confidence. But things have changed at the Montreal Board of Trade, as explained by its vice president, Alex Harper. Whereas in uh, bygone days, and that's not that many years ago, uh, if there was one Anglophone in the room, uh, everything was uh, in English. Uh, and today, uh, if there's one Francophone in the room, very often we'll see it being exactly the opposite. That is to say, all of the Anglophones will uh, speak French, and enthusiastically so. At Concordia University, the new reality of Montreal's business world is well understood. And there's a course where Juliette Laplante Leroux teaches young Anglos how to survive. C'est de mieux connaître le Québec, la culture québécoise, les Québécois, les gens en général, c'est-à-dire en grande partie eux-mêmes. Voilà. As the teacher says, it's to know Quebec better. And to do this, the class will listen to French music, visit French bars, and, of course, discuss politics. The course is called The Art of Living in French. And some of the students find that their efforts to do this are not always encouraged. Je lui demande, où sont les chambres L400? Et il commence à rire, il, 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 dit, il, il dit, chambre, les chambres? Et je dis, oh, je m'excuse, les salles, les salles. Ainsi, fond, 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 trois petits tours. Ainsi, fond, fond, fond. For young Anglophones, French immersion right from the start. In English Montreal, this practice has become a major aspect of education. In many school districts, the overwhelming majority of kindergarten pupils are thoroughly immersed. Brian, we're going to wait a few minutes. Après, on va aller boire de l'eau. Après. D'accord? Après, nous irons boire... It all started here, at the St. Lambert Elementary School. It was here, in 1965, that Quebec's very first French immersion class was held. There were 26 students in that kindergarten class, and most of them grew up to speak very good French. But still, by now, at least half of those former students have moved out of Quebec. We do a lot of immigrants. They uh, seem to come to Quebec for a while and then move out after a year to, to Ontario or Vancouver. Um, Roger Boulard is an executive with a trucking company that specializes in traveling the legendary Highway 401. Trucks that carry not only furniture, but also economic potential. We moved a Kuwaiti family that were, was here about six months, a beautiful house. The house was worth about $400,000 and uh, moved them to Mississauga. They were going there to invest money to start up a business. Hey, uh, when will you yourself be leaving? I'll probably leave in about uh, five years when I've moved everybody out of the province. Made my money and leave. So the question is, why are these people wanting to leave Quebec if they speak French perfectly. Maria Peluso teaches political science at Concordia University. You know, last year 256 Anglophones applied for jobs in the Quebec public sector, and yet only six were hired. So whether you speak French or not is really not an issue. 
The point is, is that you're not French. The point is, is that you're not de souche québécoise. And there's something inherently racist with that. There is something that is inherently discriminatory. Sack Theater's production of The Menace of Venice. Hands up. Pretend you're in New York City. Hands up just like this. You too can participate in this fringe festival of the theater. There's also a jazz festival, a comedy festival, a film festival, a modern dance festival. For some young Anglos, this is Montreal at its most exciting. Why abandon a city that offers so much? There are young Anglos who are optimistic about Montreal. But they're often artists, actors, journalists. They're like Americans in Paris in the 1920s, immensely stimulated by the presence of another culture. But they're a tiny minority, very different from those thousands of Anglos who are looking for more conventional jobs. My students tell me all the time, in a class, say, of about 100 students, 95% of them have no intention of staying here. For affluent, educated Anglos, at least there are options. But things are much harder for the poor, many of whom have never had a chance to learn French. And if they can't find jobs here, they often haven't got the resources to pack up and head for Toronto or Calgary. Save our school! Save our school! Save our school! Save our school! It's St. Kevin's School. The Catholic School Board wants to bus the children to other schools far away. But the Parents Committee is fighting the board, with Annette Brown leading the battle. They won't permit us to share the school with the French children because they feel that our language, English, is a detriment. They feel that we will contaminate the French children. And we've surveyed the French parents, and the French parents have absolutely no objection to sharing the building with us. I think if it was taken out of the hands of the politicians, put back to the children and the parents who own these schools, basically, it would be far better off because they have no objection. The common people have absolutely no objection to sharing buildings, French and English children, together. It's a refrain often heard in Montreal. The ordinary people, English and French, get along wonderfully well together despite the ultranationalists and their stern warnings about the deadly English bacteria. Kensington School, closed 1978. Victoria School, closed 1979. Baron Bing High School, closed 1980. In 20 years, 100 schools. The schools close. The young people leave the city the best and the brightest of the young Anglos, and they take with them the seed of future generations. We see everything that matters to us is gone, as far as I'm concerned. Last summer, especially after the, at the Meech Lake, I began to feel unwanted and unaccepted. We're the scapegoats. We're the people that are being left behind, and we're the cost of Canadian unity. Politics is about power, and power is about votes. The votes in Quebec are French. The result is that every government in, in, in Ottawa has always been far, far more concerned about the French and almost indifferent to the English. And the result of that is that the English simply have no friends in Ottawa. They never have had. I love Montreal. I love it. It's a great city. It has so much culture and so it's just like beautiful, but if I have to leave, I have to leave. The beauty of Montreal. There's no other city quite like it. Those who have to leave say goodbye with great sadness.
September 8, 1973. The Van Horn House, one of the great mansions, is being torn down to make way for a nondescript office building. There has been a tremendous outcry from conservationists, but the government of Quebec has refused to help preserve this historic landmark of English Montreal, home of the man who built the Canadian Pacific Railway. Just down the street from the Van Horn House, the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, founded by Anglos and full of paintings donated by Anglos. But today it is no longer allowed to show the world its original English name. In this way, Montreal's history is being rewritten. Dorchester Boulevard, named after an early British governor who persuaded London to facilitate the survival of the French language in conquered Quebec. The existence of a French Canada today owes much to Lord Dorchester's efforts. And in 1987, Montreal acknowledged this by changing the name of his street to Boulevard René Lévesque. This used to be Peace Centennial Elementary School and it was, oh I guess, the, the social and educational center for generations of thousands of families of English-speaking Quebecers. Today, today it's called the Centre Jean-Marie Gauvreau. Nowhere is there the slightest indication that English people were ever here. The people are gone, their communities are gone, and I guess even the memories are going to go very soon. The Montreal Winter Carnival, a hundred years ago. An Anglo initiative to contribute to the liveliness of the city. Making it, one journalist wrote, a very paradise of joyousness and mirth. Blocks of ice cut from the frozen St. Lawrence River. They will be used to build the great ice palace in Dominion Square, the crowning glory of the winter carnival. With its tower 100 feet high, the ice palace was an object of wonder. But today, little is remembered about those bygone times, about English Montreal's enormous contribution to the life of the city and the growth of Canada. In Montreal schools, English and French alike, little or nothing about this is ever taught. The curriculum set by the Quebec government finds it of no importance. In the 1880s, there was a new ice palace every winter. In the spring, these noble structures would gradually melt away. Now, in the years to come, in the decades to come, could the memory of English Montreal and its achievements also melt away into oblivion? It's a thought that sometimes occurs to beleaguered Anglos in their darkest moments. I feel very hopeless about it all. The youth, the intelligence here, yeah. the, the whole strength in the Anglo community is just slipping away. It's just uh, like a hemorrhage.